Hey everyone, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman and uh, joining me again today is the apologist David Zills. David, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Brain is moving slowly today, but I'm looking forward to a boring week where I can kind of gain momentum with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a sign that you're getting older is when things are boring, you're actually, you're very, very happy. Boring becomes, <laughs> boring becomes a wonderful thing when you get old kids. Uh, just something to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. All right. So David, uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, the Bible being a historical document. Not only is it actually and truly God's word, but you can, you can rest assured that it exists inside of history. But if it is a history book, uh, essentially, even if it is also God's word, are there other history books that corroborate it, or is it sort of its only claim saying that Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah, so that's kind of an interesting question. I know when I was uh, doubting my faith, really trying to figure out, is this stuff real? I learned a lot about the stuff we talked about the last two times about, is the Bible historically reliable, specifically the New Testament and its claims about Jesus? And that was helpful, but I know where things started to really click with me was when I started looking at primary sources outside the New Testament. So primary sources, you know, a lot of people will say history is written by the winners, um, and that's that that um, accusation really applies to secondary sources, whereas people writing about history after the fact, but they weren't there. The primary sources are the people who are actually there. And what, there are actually a lot of primary sources that we have from the first century after Jesus, first century to century and a half. And it's surprisingly for some kind of no-name preacher in Israel that you wouldn't think you know anyone would care about. There's actually a lot of people that mention him whose documents we still have, and this is all outside the New Testament. So when I started looking at that stuff, I started thinking, hmm. I suppose Jesus really existed because all these people knew about him. And it sounds like the major outline of the New Testament, maybe not specific miracles or specific teachings, but the major outline is corroborated by all these other sources. So if you look at, um, you know, just, just say seven sources from the first century to a century and a half after Jesus, four of them are non-Christian, three of them are Christian, but not, not apostles, nobody that you've probably heard about. Oh, well, you probably have Harrison, but you know, I hadn't heard about them until I researched until I got into it. But um, you, it turns out you can reconstruct Jesus was a real person. He lived in Judea. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate while Herod was the Tetrarch. He was accused of leading Israel to apostasy by the Jews. So, of course, the Jewish leaders said his teachings were false teachings. Similarly, the Jews accused him of being a sorcerer. You know, you can remember those encounters in the Gospels where Jesus is accused of doing casting out demons by the prince of demons. Um, and so it's not surprising that later Jewish sorcerers kind of reiterate this claim that, yeah, that Jesus guy, he, he was a sorcerer. And so that's why we killed him. It says Jesus was hanged on the eve of the Passover, hanging that language consistent with crucifixion. So all these things, in addition to, um, you know, that his followers believed that he had been risen from the dead and was the son of God. So pretty much the whole outline of the major Christian teachings you can find without ever looking in the Bible, which is kind of surprising at first. That's most of the creed. That That's almost every line of the creed minus, uh, again, sort of the, he descended into hell and ascended into heaven. I, I've got the whole creed by people who weren't associated with the scripture. Right. So that's, that's really interesting. So you know, what's the value of these sources? You know, on the one hand, I don't think we should go to them for our, for the, as the best sources about Jesus. Uh, they're getting all their information secondhand. These Christians even said, you know, we're getting our information from the apostles. These non-Christians were getting their information information from other Christians. So this is all secondhand testimony about Jesus. It's no one who was with Jesus. And so that's where the Bible is still our best source, because, you know, as we discussed last time, it's written by people who had access to eyewitness testimony. But what it these outside sources, what they do do is they give us some, some confidence that the eyewitnesses 
or that the sources that claim to have been by eyewitnesses, that they were actually real. You know, if you take the New Testament out of history, there's still enough left in history that you can reconstruct the Bible's major claims. And so it kind of makes sense then that we should go to the Bible to get the details on what everything else is telling us happened. Right. So what you're saying, we won't learn anything new about Jesus here, but it's really, really hard to not believe in Jesus based on real time and space history with this. Yeah. So yeah, it depends what you mean by believe in Jesus. So was Jesus a real person? Most scholars today would not debate that. There are a few that are kind of on the fringe that would say Jesus isn't real, but there's just way too much data around Jesus that it, it doesn't make sense to claim that this person never existed. Um, now you can say, was Jesus a real person and was he crucified? Most people wouldn't debate that. You know, maybe some Muslim scholars would because um, of some statements in Islam where Jesus never actually died. Um, but but most people would say, yeah, Jesus was crucified. Now, when you get to the supernatural stuff, that's where, you know, even when you look at these early sources, there are fault lines. The non-Christians will say, well, there are these claims about him, but we don't take this seriously. And then the Christians will say, no, 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 these are the claims and they're from eyewitnesses. And so we believe them. And so the supernatural claims are kind of where the fault lines draw are drawn in the early um, sources between people that accepted them and people that said, well, this is reported of him, but I don't believe it. Fair enough. So I guess, can we talk about a few of them? Yeah. So, um, so let's start with the non-Christian sources. Those are kind of the ones you think you would want to go to next because, you know, a lot of people say, you know, Christian sources are biased, you know, and that, that cuts a couple different ways. Um, you know, last time we talked about the fact that would they have incentive to make stuff up? Not really. They were kind of the scum of the earth. And a lot of these other sources outside the New Testament will consistently say these people are the scum of the earth. And so they had little incentive to to make this stuff up. Um, second of all, I mean, sometimes the people with the greatest interest in historical events, you might call it bias, but sometimes they're the ones who are the most careful to preserve it. So an analogy might be Jews um, who experienced the Holocaust. You know, no one would say Jews preserving Holocaust history are unreliable sources because they have a vested interest in it. No, because of their vested interest, they're going to be careful to preserve the facts. And so, you know, bias cuts both ways. But, you know, unsympathetic witnesses are always helpful to say, well, it's not just the people who are on board with this teaching, but other people are saying, yeah, this stuff really happened. So let's go to some of those. Um, so one of them is Tacitus. He was a Roman historian who wrote um, a history of, uh, I think, Rome around the time 115 AD. So this is um, a little bit just into the second century. And he lists a number of details about Jesus. He, he talks about Christians. He talks about them being persecuted under Nero. And he talks about who the person that they're following, the teachings that they're following, coming from a man named Christus, um, which is the Rome, the, the Latin for Christ, which, um, and it said, and he mentions that this Christ suffered the extreme penalty, read crucifixion, during the reign of Tiberius at the hand of Pontius Pilate, and then it's interesting. He says a most mischievous superstition broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. And so this most mischievous superstition, you know, is, it has something to do with people following this crucified guy. Don't ask me why, you know, like, how can we make sense of people follow, you know, following a crucified guy? Um, but it's some kind of mischievous superstition that started in Judea and reached Rome. And so this is, a, you know, the outline of the book of Acts, and it's right here in 115 AD. And, you know, the most mischievous superstition could perhaps refer to belief in Jesus' resurrection. You know, we don't, we don't know what exactly he was referring to. Um, but we also, there's a lot of language that is used in there that's pejorative toward Christians, and it even talks about them being persecuted. So we also get this picture that, again, Christ's followers were hated and persecuted early on. And so that all of this we get from one source, just kind of a little paragraph inside Tacitus's annals from 115 AD. 
That's awesome. So I, I, I kind of like that he's mad at us while he's doing it, because again, like, why are you trying to preserve the miracle if you don't believe in it? But at the same time, it's hard to deny that the people are, are willing to go to persecution, proclaiming a mysterious and uh, what would you say? Um, most mischievous, mis- most mischievous superstition. That's a great Easter sermon right there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, so yeah, that, that was a, a Gentile source, so Roman. We can go to a Jewish source. Most people have heard of Josephus, the Jewish historian who famously kind of sold out on his Jewish brethren and went and served Rome after Jerusalem was sacked in 70 AD. Um, but Josephus wrote um, his Antiquities, which uh, was a history pretty broad in scope, but he wrote it just before 100 AD. Um, and in that, there are two quotes um, that of interest. One talks about a man named James, who was the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ. And so here we have a man named Jesus, who was called Christ, which is the Greek for the Hebrew equivalent Messiah. Um, so we, we have Josephus saying there's this man, Jesus, who made messianic claims, and he had a brother named James. Um, so there we have at least something, you know, corroborating there's Jesus, he made messianic claims, he had a brother named James. Again, fully consistent with what we know from the New Testament. There's another quote from Josephus, which is a bit tricky because in it, Josephus makes claims that sound like he's a Christian, which he most definitely wasn't. So he'll say things like, you know, he'll say things that only Christians would say. Um, and so historians kind of think that there was an original text by Josephus, but over time, as it was getting copied, the Christians kind of put stuff in there and kind of said, well, Josephus should have said this. And so it's kind of hard to get behind that. But when you do get behind that, there, there's there's this, um, there's a, a kernel behind this quote that even if you remove the parts that look like Christians added them, it still corroborates some basic details about Jesus. So for example, that Jesus was a man of virtue. He had a large following. Again, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was reported to have been raised from the dead and he made messianic claims. So, you know, there's a huge, uh, uh, an outline of the Bible, of the New Testament, of the Gospels. And it's again from someone who is not sympathetic to Christianity. Another one would be Lucian, who was, um, going back to a Gentile source who has some correspondence that's preserved to this day with the emperor Trajan. And in that correspondence, he talks about, you know, there are these Christians, they're kind of being defiant. They're not worshiping the gods of Rome. I'm not sure how to do with them. I'm not sure what to do with them. You know, what do you advise emperor? And they kind of have this correspondence about how should I deal with these obstinate Christians who don't follow the gods of Rome. And in it, there are a couple details that stand out. One, Christians were worshiping the crucified Christ. So again, we get that Christ was crucified. Everybody noticed that Jesus was crucified because it's really odd in the Greco-Roman to worship or to follow a crucified person because that's like the worst thing that can happen to anyone. It's you know, the epitome of shame. So people notice when you're, when you're saying, yeah, I follow this crucified guy, but not only that is that Lucian says they were worshiping him. Um, so, and he even says they were singing songs to him as to a God. Um, yeah, let me, I'm checking my notes real quick. Yeah. No, that's so, good around. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 it's more than just, uh, it's more than just moral following. Yeah, it's more than just a moral following. There's this worship aspect. And then again, Christians were persecuted yet courageous in the faiths of death because of some belief that they were immortal. So we have all these things cropping up again, persecuted, courageous. I believe I'm immortal because Jesus rose. And by the way, I'm worshiping him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's it's again, it, it's it's impressive to, to sort of recognize that throughout history, people are outside of Christianity, pointing to Christianity as a real thing. And you mentioned early on, just as almost a, a little comment, but it, it matters. If, if he really is just a, a no-name preacher from a no-name place, why does anybody outside of that no-name place care? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think, you know, uh, one part of the answer has to be because his following spread very rapidly. 
right. after his death. But that's a curious thing to build a religion around somebody's death. Um, and actually have it take off. Yeah. Like when, when you look at a, um, there's this dialogue in the book of Acts where Gamaliel t- talks to the Sanhedrin and says, you know, there were a number of messianic figures who got killed and afterward their followers dispersed so be careful what you do with the apostles this is post easter post ascension and pentecost he says be careful what you do because if this is of man it will fail but if this is of god you might find yourself opposing god himself which is an interesting comment but you know most messianic figures when they are proven not to be the messiah by getting crucified or killed in some way, you know, that's the end of it. Obviously, that's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. And so it's very curious that that is precisely when Christianity exploded across the Mediterranean. Absolutely. And and again, these are not from the Bible, but outside of the Bible, but they point to the fact that maybe you can trust the Bible. Exactly. Yeah. And so the the thing that gets tricky is, um, again, none of these people are going to say, well, Jesus rose. They say he was reported that he rose. And they'll never say Jesus was God. They'll say, well, they were worshiping him. Um, So that's interesting. So maybe we could turn to some early Christian sources who would give us some more insight into where these ideas came from. Yeah, absolutely. So there are three uh, Christian sources. There's a whole This was something that blew my mind when I first learned it. There's a whole generation of Christian writers whose writings we still have who were one generation away from the apostles. So it turns out that if you look at church history, we have writings from every generation going all the way back to the apostles. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to look and see if the story changed. And if the further back we go, do things get less supernatural? Do they get... Uh, is is Easter taken out? Is the Trinity taken out? All these things. And we can kind of see, did the story change over time? And there are three writers in particular, Clement, who was the pastor in the Roman church around the end of the first century, Ignatius, who was pastor in the church in Antioch, which I believe was the same church that sent Paul on his missionary journeys. And he wrote in the first two decades of the second century so 100 to 120 ad he actually wrote seven letters while on the way to being basically fed to the animals in the Colosseum in rome so he was definitely thinking about you know what's what's the meaning of life and what's my legacy and he's writing letters to all these people and one of his letters is to a pastor named polycarp who was the pastor in Smyrna, who also wrote a letter soon after that, um, right around the same time. And so between Clement, Ignatius, and Polycarp, we have three early Christians who um, lived, whose lives overlapped with the lives of the apostles. In fact, uh, someone one generation later who said that he knew Polycarp in, while he was his name was Arrhenius, and when he was young, he knew Polycarp when Polycarp was old, and he said, yeah, Polycarp and Clement, two of these three, actually knew the apostles, and people in their circles knew the apostles, and so this is interesting because it allows us to get to the very beginning of Christianity without looking at the Bible and see, you know, what, what was the story then, and the interesting thing is these writers are pretty consistent in saying, first of all, we got our story from the apostles. So they're not, you know, saying that we, they're all unanimous in saying the apostles preached this story. They got it from Jesus and they preached it publicly to the world. And then second of all, they'll say this story includes the resurrection and it includes that Jesus was sent from God. And Ignatius even calls Jesus God. Like, let me see if I can find the quote here. Um, yeah, he says, I glorify Jesus Christ, the God who made you so wise. So he he calls Jesus God. Um, and so, and, and then all, all of these writers also allude to the fact that the apostles themselves were persecuted and willing to suffer for their beliefs. And so you kind of get this picture that this, we know that this story came from people who claim to be eyewitnesses, even without looking at the Gospels or the New Testament. They were willing to suffer for their 
beliefs and the story included all the supernatural bits that you might think might have developed as legendary developments over time. That really, really matters. We can actually sort of watch the story unfold from the very students of the apostles in some cases all the way down the road. And so, yeah, it, again, it, it's, it's, it's not going to replace the Bible, but it's going to point to it as something that you can depend on. Yeah. And that's the thing that's really interesting. If some good references for digging into this, there's one that's called, uh, it's gone by different titles, but one of the titles was The Verdict of History, and it's written by Gary Habermas, and it's basically a survey of sources outside the Bible that you can use to reconstruct the entire outline of the Gospels in the New Testament. So that's a very interesting read. Um, and that was one where I started to think, huh, maybe this isn't just something I need to just believe the Bible. Maybe there's more to this that I can ground in history when I was doing my searching. Another one is to actually get get the writings of these early Christians. There's a, They're called the Apostolic Fathers because they were conversant. A lot of them you know, knew the apostles, or at least their lives were adjacent to the apostles. So the Apostolic Fathers, and a, a good translation is the Apostolic Fathers in English, translated by Michael Holmes. And that translation, I actually have the stamp of approval from a seminary professor in Fort Wayne that that's a good one. So good it's one. actually very edifying. These, these guys, I mean, they were living in challenging times, but they, they had access to some of the first sources about this. And it's really interesting to read. It really encouraged my faith, not just from an apologetic standpoint, but even spiritually. These are great people to kind of just learn from. Absolutely. Yeah, the fathers and a lot of these works too are, are um, available for free now because they're, the books are old enough that you can get them on, out of Guten, Gutenberg or things like that. So, yep, absolutely. Well, that's, that's a lot to chew on already. Uh, David, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. It's fun. Hey, have a great day. You too. Bye.